we're talking about the tools of fellowship. When Grace and I first got here at Grace Fellowship Church, the country was still in the process of uh, finding a way to get out of the whole COVID crisis, the COVID mess. I mean, it was in the infancy of, of the exiting stage, and it seems like we're just now leaving the woods on that. Kevin had it recently, again. Um, I, te- I, te- I took a test when I was sick because I know I have to be around a lot of people. I didn't have it, but, but it's, still, it's still brought up a lot. And, and I've brought this up before. Even during that time, Grace Fellowship Church here never even considered uh, weakening or surrendering its position in serving the Lord and serving the community. And uh, through the grace of God, we have managed to flourish as, as a church flourishing at a time when other churches were closing and that to me that was just shocking that churches were actually closing for good but it was happening uh, a shock to the system in any community has the ability to do that i mean it, 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 if it's a big enough shock it can it can ripple and uh break a church down and they'll close if the fellowship isn't strong and i mean now a shock to the system. We see the events playing out in the Holy Land at war with the enemies of God, and that's who they're at war with, the enemies of God. There's, there's even more to be concerned about in the, the volatile world, as, as crazy as it is. It can, get, it can shake up your focus, shake up the way you look at things, and get to us. And it can attempt to tear down fellowship. Churches do close. If we allow it, I mean, if we allow it to break down our fellowship, but the, the root of the problem is fear. It's always fear. Fear is the root of the problem. It's fear, typically fear of the darkness, uh, you know, and I'm referring to obviously the darkness that's in the world. Church is closed because instead of trusting Jesus and clinging to the body of Christ and fellowship, people gave in to uncertainty fostered by fear, which leads to complacency. And then that ends in the consequence of broken fellowship. So that's an extinct congregation, essentially. Church, people get paranoid because church is just a nice thing I do on the side. But I got other things to worry about now. That kind of fear does it. But I got news for you. I got news for everyone here. Uncertainty is guaranteed to us by God. It is guaranteed that we will have uncertainty in this life. It's absolutely promised. And the instructions for navigating it are all through the Bible. And I could have picked many verses, but there's a lot of verses today. So I picked Psalm 56, 3, which says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Because in abandoning the security found in the collective body of Christ here at the church, during that time, people exchanged their fellowship for, you know, cowering in their living rooms, staying at home, watching streaming church. That was a big one. Watching streaming church online, which is exactly why I stopped it here in our church. I, I discontinued all. We did it for a while. And, and then I said, we're stopping it. Because fellowship and, and what it is cannot be duplicated, replicated, or even effectively or accurately presented uh, on a screen or online. Now, I, I do need to say, it's important to mention that it was important for us to, and it still is, to post our church messages because there are people who can't come to church and they're old and they don't feel well and they're, they're, they may be sick or, or they have some extenuating circumstance and they need, they need the message. They need Bible-based teaching. So it's imperative to acknowledge that it's, it's important that we do that. But the act of fellowship itself is just in-person communion with other believers to share in the presence of the Holy Spirit and God for worship. That's, that's exactly what it is. Now, 1 John 1 through 5, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have the fellowship with one another. Matthew eighteen twenty says, For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, uh, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward... I, I gotta, before I read this, i got to say, this is what I always think of when people say, well, I just don't feel like you have to go to church to be a good Christian. I did a whole sermon on why that's nonsense and what the Bible says about it. So I'm, I'm going to read this. And let us consider how we, we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing 
but encouraging one another with all the more as we see the day approaching. So the translation is when life gets harder, lean harder into the body of Christ. Lean harder into your fellowship. Now, it, it's our duty for those of us who can to seek out those who can't come to church and to take the fellowship to them. But the bottom line is, as the world gets darker, we have to shine brighter. We can't close the curtains and say, I'm afraid of the dark. I'll just make it a little darker. But it's my darkness. And that's what a lot of people do. And it's sad. I've done two sermons in the past three years on fellowship. The first one was my first sermon ever here. It's the, the message I delivered to, to where the congregation would vote whether they wanted me. And then I did a, another message on it a couple of years later. Uh, but those messages were about the importance of fellowship. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the tools of fellowship. We say, yeah, fellowship's important, and we know coming to church is fellowship. But today, we're going to be a little more specific about what the tools of fellowship actually are that we use to build the foundation. So we'll look at them and address, address how we are challenged, how we can challenge ourselves to grow in them, because they're simple. They are forgiveness. I'm sorry, they're friendship, forgiveness, finance, and faith. These are, the, these are the four. Friendship, forgiveness, finance, and faith. Friendship is what strengthens every other form of fellowship. That if you, if you befriend people and you build relationships, everything else gets better. So when you enter the body of Christ, you should eventually forge meaningful relationships. I mean, the purpose of this is so we got to uplift each other. So we can strengthen each other. Right? Iron sharpens iron. In return, we get the same thing back from other people. It's no brainer. I really don't have to explain this. We understand why friendship's important Be because just showing up to church to to see, you know, how fast you can get in the parking lot and get out when it's over doesn't do you any good. It's it's just you're better off just not even not even showing up at all. Uh, so these relationships, these friendships we build, it's important that we're here for that purpose too. They are so important to God that in Scripture, He even places them at a higher place of priority than making an offering. In Matthew 5, 23 through 24, He says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first, Go and be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. So not only does this show us how absolutely paramount the harmony between one another is to God, our friendships, our relationships, it also puts on grand display the majesty of the next tool of fellowship. And that's, that's a forgiveness. That's another one that's had its own, its own sermon on the one topic. The other tool of forgiveness. I always tell, I've said this, you've, there's a lot of things you're hearing me say today, you've heard me say before. It, the most like God you can be is when you are extending forgiveness. Because we, we know to return good with evil uh, is evil. You know, somebody's doing, not doing anything wrong to you and you go take from them or you hurt them, that's evil. You're returning good with evil. To return evil with evil is human. You punch me in the nose, I'm going to punch you in the nose. That's what people do. But to return evil with good is divine. That's of God. Because that's what, and that's hard to do. But that is divine. That is what God has done for us. So the most like God you can be is to forgive. If you've ever been involved in a moment, the power of forgiveness and this tools of fellowship... If you've ever been in a mall, uh, involved in a moment where two people are forgiving each other, you have to know there's something extraordinary going on. I mean, a genuine forgiveness. People that were maybe bitter and didn't talk for a long time, or a family member, or a friend that scorned you or burned you really bad. There's, there's usually, at this moment, it's like a dam bursts, and there's hugging, and there's crying, and there's, there's this magic. This, you can just feel it's such a God moment when reconciliation, restoration, healing come from forgiveness. It's, it's something, it, it, it smashes boundaries that people thought before would, y'all never, oh, no way, I'm done with them, I'm not forgiving them. And God says, I can smash any boundary. And it just, you can feel it in those moments. And the, the Bible, 
The Bible even puts these things, all these things, in a very specific order, in one verse, in one verse. And that's Ephesians 4.32, where it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. It's easy to read that sentence without thinking about what I just said, but it starts with friendship. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Then defines the action necessary for strengthening that love. Forgiving each other. And ends explaining why is it is of divine origin. Just as Christ has forgiven you. This, this concept is repeated throughout the entire Bible. So it, start, it, it starts with friendship, defines the action for strengthening that kind of love, and ends with explaining why it's divine. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. It's repeated through the whole Bible. I just jotted down Luke 17. These aren't up there because I'm not, I don't, I'm not reading these verses. Luke 17, 3 through 4, Luke 6, 37, Mark 11, 25, Colossians 3, 12 through 13, that entire that entire uh, verse I just read is repeated just there for starters. And then the next one, and this is, this is a lot of people don't like to talk about, <laughs> is finance. So let's just, well, first of all, let's start by saying that Jesus and the disciples had money to manage. They, they had to. It was given to them by donors, by people who believed in them, by people who believed in his message and his ministry. And they wanted them to have the resources to carry on. And, and a lot of people here know that I don't like talking about money. I, I don't. You're supposed to talk about tithing and all that stuff and gifting and money in church. And I think I've done it once. I, 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 it's, it's a... I should do it more often, and I know I've said this before when it comes to, you know, there's two schools of thought with a pastor, a pastor that knows every detail of what's going on in the church with money, um, and one who says, I need to focus on the Word of God, not money, and that's me. I don't want to know about the money. The people we have that work in our church are very, very good at what they do and very competent, and I don't want to be tempted to be talking to someone and think to myself, wow, you sure give a lot, or... You know, you don't give very much. or I, I, I don't want that in my head. So I don't have anything to do uh, with money. And now I've had people come up to me and say, I want to do this for the church. And so I know about it because they came to me. But I, don't, I, know, it's, I know it's important. I know it's important. But just, just as for the disciples, money is to us. And that's a tool. Money is just a tool. That's what, and that's the way we should look at it as Christians. We need to think of it. We... we we need to not think of money the way the world thinks of money, like as an avenue for quenching uh, thirst, the thirst of the desire for materialism. Because we're so used to hearing corruption and money about the same thing. It's, it's almost a dirty word. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, but that's not what it is in the Christian walk. Instead, we see it for what it is. It's a representation of our time. It's a representation of our work. And it's a representation of the gifts and the power that God has given given us each individually. And the reason that it's relevant is because um, that's what God is asking. 10% of what he has given you, you know, your gift. And I know in the back, there's got to be somebody going, well, that's not in the New Testament. Uh, I'm, I haven't forgotten you folks. I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> if you're any, if any of you are here. So, you know, if you make $100,000 and you say, well, 10% is $10,000. I'm not giving that much. Which is like saying, God doesn't know how to budget that money. I don't, I, you know, I, I can do that. That's a sign we're not looking at it the right way, if, if any of us think that way. Uh, the church prayerfully makes decisions on what to use money here for serving and spreading the gospel. Uh, any responsible church does, any church that's blessed. Here it's, you know, youth ministry, outreach events, expanding our reach through the media, build and develop fellowship with the lost. We just, you, you just met Tim Holcomb a couple weeks ago. Halfway around the world, churches are now built and forming under trees. That's because of this Congress. That's you. That's, these things are being accomplished because of what you're doing in the body of Christ. So we do think things through. We have meetings. The elders talk about being stewards of God's, the resources God puts in our, in our lap. We're not like the government. You know, we don't take your money and write checks to deadbeats who don't want to work. 
That doesn't happen in church, and it'll never happen in church, not on my watch. We, we do the work of the Lord, and, and we do it with a, strong, with a strong sense of purpose, and we take that responsibility very serious. And not everyone has money. I know that. Not everyone has money. And I talked about that, too, in the, about Jesus. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into that, that whole message again, but the lady who gave out of her poverty. And everyone said, oh, she's blessed. She gave her last few pennies. And look, and that's, that's the wrong way to teach that message. Um, Jesus, the very next thing Jesus says is, uh, I'm tearing down this way of doing things. Because she gave that money out of her poverty, and he, he talked about her, and then the, 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 the disciple said, look at this place, it's an amazing place. Jesus said, yeah, you think so? Well, not one stone's going to let me. I'm, staying, I'm tearing down this way of doing things. That's the church. That's the way the church should be. We, we shouldn't exploit widows and poor people and old people for their last penny. We, we should, these are the people we're supposed to help. We're not supposed to wring them out dry. That's not what we do. And there are people who teach that, 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 that message. They use just that part and they leave off the next part. And they, they say, give to your broke. I want all your cat food money and your social security and you'll go to heaven. Nonsense. That's not true and that's not what was meant. So sometimes one man can pay to dig a well for a church and build a room addition. And all another person can do is just as big of a deal. Bring meals and pray to the elderly. Spend time with them. They don't have money, but they have time. They have love. They have Christ in their heart. These things are of equal value. They're of equal value. I know this because I've seen it. What I just told you, I saw that happen. I, saw, I know there's a guy who's a very successful person who a church that we went to before did a lot of things that he didn't want anyone to know about. And I found out by accident later that he was one behind. And good, these are good things. These are things this church couldn't afford to do, and he just did them. And also people who go secretly and visit people, take gifts, spend time with people. And it, these are all kingdom work. These are all kingdom fingerprints. So it's, it's, so when, you bring up, when you bring up finance and the pulpit, I think this is the third time in my pastoral career I've done it, it has to be explained right. 10% of what one can give expands the reach of God, of the gospel, through the church's capabilities. Uh, while the 10% of what one can give might be money, and the other person, it might be just wrapping the arms of God around someone who's hurting. So Paul did that all the time. You hear about giftings. Gifting is anything above tithing, depending on who you ask. Paul's like, I, I sent you a gift, and they sent me a gift. He's talking about money. He's in prison. He needs to eat. These Christians have to take care of each other back then, and that's what they did. And money's like manure, you know? You spread it around, and things grow. You pile it up, and it just stinks. So I want to read something from Leviticus, from the Old Testament. Leviticus 27, 30 through 34. Remember, we're talking about the tools of fellowship. A tithe of everything from the, from the land, whether grain, from soil, from fruit, from trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth to the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and of the flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands of the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. And people say, you know, you know what? I hear people say this all the time that don't want to, don't want to do any financial stuff for the church. They go, Jesus, Jesus never said anything about tithing 10%. He never did. And you know what? Uh, I, they're right. I can't find anything that he ever said anything about that. Give 10%. So, so where, are these, where do these people get this, this tithing thumb? Okay, well, I'll tell you what we can say with absolute certainty is that Jesus never dis diminished or discarded anything in the Old Testament. What he did do is he took everything in the Old Testament and raised it to a higher standard. So all of us to go above and beyond the standards of the Old Testament is, is, is what Jesus expected. And I just read you what was formerly expected. So through the scriptures, it addresses this in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. So 
This is on the person. This is on each person. Give what you, what, what God puts on your heart. I tell people, you don't give till it hurts. Give till it feels good. That's between you and God. I, I see a lot of pastors trying to spin a sermon to somehow convince the congregation that if you don't give 10% of your income, you are in, uh, gravely committing a sin. But I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus already said what he thinks about the giving the standards of the Old Testament and those things. And it's more of a personal relationship between you and Christ now about what you give. It, it, it is. It just is. I mean, I can't stand here and tell you if you don't give 10% of your money to the church, you're going to hell. You, that's just inaccurate and untrue. But we have a very generous congregation who does care about the church. And the reason we preach about fellowship in a place where we have good fellowship is hopefully that we tell the rest of the world about the fellowship we have because we are blessed. Faith. That's the last one. Faith. How in the world can we expect, <laughs> how in the world can we expect any blessing or confidence or joy if we, don't have, if we don't have faith? I mean, how can we expect any sense of optimism if we don't have faith? Faith in Christ. That's another thing. I hear people say a lot, well, I got through it because I have faith. Faith in what? What do you have faith in? Because that matters. <laughs> what you put your faith in matters greatly. Faith that every friendship we cultivate, every act of forgiveness that we extend, or every penny or even span of time that we give ourselves will be used to glorify God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way of obtaining eternal assurance. So no matter what happens tomorrow, if I'm about my father's business, I'll return home safely, right? Yeah, amen? I'm not talking about safely by the world standards. I'm going to get hurt. Like I said at the beginning, uncertainty is guaranteed to us. These are the four tools vital for building the foundation of fellowship, for, for building harmony together that we're talking about. Friendship is the tool. You can put that other slide up if you want. Uh, friendship is a tool of strengthening others. Forgiveness, the tool of sharing God's power. Finance, the tool of sharing the power God has given you or gifts. Faith, the tool of wielding assurance through trust in Christ. It's the foundation of fellowship. The whole thing is built on fortitude. How do we get to the word fortitude? Because we started this message off talking about the things that tear down fellowship. Fear, darkness, world events, COVID, wars, uncertainty. These tear things down because you don't have fortitude. I don't mean you. I mean people in the world who close their church doors, their congregations. They, don't, they can't muscle through it. They can't power through it. They don't have any grit. In terms of the strength of their faith, fortitude, these tools build fortitude. That's what allows us to stay the course in a world that's hostile to God. The word fortitude, if you look it up, just says courage in pain or adversity. It gives me strength to carry on when the world is enduring its COVID. When the world looks like the book of Revelations is unfolding on the news. When I lose someone I love. When I get a bad news from a phone call from the doctor. I have the fortitude because I've exercised the tools of fellowship. Whatever I did in my church, my body of Christ, my part of, I lean into it more. By the tools of fellowship, I have the fortitude to carry on in fellowship. Because it's the desire of God that I do so for the benefit of... Because I be, we benefit from this stuff. You don't just go to church just to give. You get what you give, everything you get. Your friendships, you feel better, you feel forgiven. If you're down, somebody's going to help you. If you need help, somebody's going to pick you up. I have a faith that cannot be shaken because of this. I can't imagine myself outside of the body of Christ, outside of this church, this particular exact church, in fact... And, and I hope everyone here feels that way too. Life application is to quite simply challenge yourself. Um, as I said at the beginning, as the world gets darker, we, we have to get brighter. I mean, even if you're comfortable in your faith walk, and, and a lot of us are, you know. Hey, man, I give a lot to the church. I do good. I show up. I volunteer at the events. I, I mean, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm in pretty good shape. Well, you probably are in good shape. I, I, this, this, isn't, this isn't a guilt trip sermon. This isn't to make anyone here feel like you don't do enough and you're not working hard enough. That's not what this is about. This, this message, in fact... This is one of the, the, our church is one of the most generous I've ever seen in terms of people giving of themselves, the time, their resources, their finances. 
I'm talking about as the world gets darker, we get brighter. So how do I lean deeper in, into my faith, into the body of Christ? Because you, you can never be too entrenched in fellowship. Evil is a disease, right? Perpetuated by our adversary. We are the spreaders of the cure. We are the spreaders of the cure. Through fellowship, we're the ones. We're the ones who take... I mean, you, you don't... The world's dark until they find... You ever found someone in your life that you just, they're just on their back? And you realize, wow, I didn't realize I, it made that big of a difference that I, I'm with this person, talking with them and spending time with them. So I would, take, I would say take this challenge with the understanding that as the world gets darker, we have to shine brighter. We set out to utilize the tools of fellowship in a one-month period. You see for yourself if you can't feel the presence of God working in your life. Because no matter how, I mean, we're people, we're flawed. Sometimes we get our priorities. Well, I do. I mean, I, I forget about doing this because I'm too focused on this. And, and I think about these, these, these tools that, that build the foundation of fellowship. Uh, friendship. What can I do? What can I do? Something I can write down on my calendar or however you log things. I, journaling is always a good thing to do. You reach out to someone you don't talk to very often. I try to do that once in a while. I have people that still consider me their pastor that don't come to church here. And I, I, a couple of them are struggling with cancer and things. And I, I think, man, I, I got I to gotta reach out and because and, uh, that's a human being. And I, I, need, I need to do that. Reach out to someone you don't talk with very often. If it's someone close by, go have lunch with them. And then forgiveness. What would the challenge on forgiveness? Well, I would reach. Here's the thing about this. I, forgiveness is a good thing to do. You can reach out to someone that you're not uh, particularly fond of or maybe you have a beef with or things aren't going too well. And, and it's never a good idea to call somebody you're having a beef with and say, just so you know, I forgive you. <laughs> that's not a, that's not a good opener. That's not a good way to start the conversation, right? It just it it never it never is. It immediately puts you here and puts them here. But you can mend fences. It's not even sometimes it's not even necessary to bring up the elephant in the room. Sometimes just sharing the human experience with someone is enough to start mending a fence. I mean, if I if I want to reach out to someone and and try to like Ben's on my last nerve like every day. No, I'm kidding. I love Ben's next. <laughs> He's never been on my last nerve. But I mean, if I had someone who was, and, and I'm like, man, I got a lot of friction with this guy. I, I, you know, over this thing, this issue we had, whatever. We wanted to put a basketball court in the, uh, in the church parking lot. I don't know. Whatever it is. Didn't go right. And we, had, we didn't have good words. So instead of going to that person and going, hey, uh, Let's go out to lunch and maybe talk about that thing. Let's for, no, forget about that thing. Let's be people together. Just say, hey, you want to get a pizza? Oh, did you want to talk about the basketball court? No, I don't want to talk about the basketball court. Who cares about that? Just, I mean, just start by sharing being a human being with someone to reconcile. To, you know, we don't have to go right to someone and say, let's talk about forgiveness and bearing the hatchet. Because when you can have fellowship with a person and friendship with a person, and they, 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 you, can, you can see the humanness of each other, you see the common ground, the common need for God, it can, that can bring about reconciliation and restoration faster than anything else. Somebody may be, not be asking for your forgiveness. But if you can charm them with a genuine, pure of heart, righteousness, and care, they'll, they might want to talk about that and say, you know, I'm sorry I did you wrong. I, aren't people like that? Aren't they really like that? I mean, when you push someone to apo apologize, 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 then they don't want to apologize. But when you treat them like gold, then they start feeling, you know what? Uh, I like you. I, I'm sorry about that thing I did. I, that's how we are, aren't we? I think we are. Amen? Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's just a golden rule. It's simple. Treat people how you want to be treated. So if you've got a beef with somebody, you've got to reconcile. You, that's the way to start it. And finance. Well, I mean, there's different ways. Finance doesn't just... I'm, I'm, I personally am not just talking about only money. But uh, challenge yourself. Give more to the church. If you don't want to give it to the church, give it to the homeless shelter. Give it to... Get, what if you can, if you can do it, be specific about what you want to r r r um, uh, give to or donate to or whatever. Give with joy. That's another thing. The Bible condemns begrudgingly uh, when you give begrudgingly. It strongly condemns that. All right, here you go. God's like, you know what? I don't want it. Thanks, but no thanks. 
That's, that's a strong part of the body. Just keep it. You keep it. You need it more than I do. You're not helping me. You're helping your brother. You're serving me. That's, that's what we have to remember. We're not, God doesn't need my help. I'm serving God when I'm helping my brother. That's, that's the thing to remember. Maybe we don't have money. Not everybody has money. You got time. We got time. We can love on someone. We can call someone. Volunteer at the church. We got a lot of people that do that. That's a big part of involved, but that covers all the other ones. Friendship, forgiveness, faith. Resolve to strengthen your faith through extra time and meditation on a specific area of your life. Set apart time to think about Jesus. Go for a walk. I always put that. Have an inner dialogue. A couple weeks ago, I was just talking about, and we're winding out here. Don't worry. I know this has been a little bit of a long one, but um, when about being honest when you pray. Some, you don't have to have candles in a prayer room and an open Bible with a stained glass window to meditate and have a relationship with God. Sometimes it's easy as just going to the shooting range. Sometimes it's easy as walking down by the river. Sometimes it's easy as sitting on the porch with some lemonade or something like that. Sometimes it's just laying on the couch, staring at the ceiling fan while the cat sleeps on your belly. There's, I mean, there's different types. For those of you who have flat bellies, I, my cat sleeps on my shoulder. But the... the, 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 the how did that make it into the sermon? Um, so, but you get the idea. There's a way you have your God time, your God talk. Church is where we should come to feel safe. We shouldn't, you know, church doors closing because things get dark. I don't get that. Every person here should call this church my church with an equal sense of purpose. My church. This is your church. This is my church. It's your church. It's your church. It's your church. It's your church. It's not, I'm the pastor. I'm not the emperor. I'm just a guy who fulfills, I, I hold one row here, uh, uh, one oar rowing. We all row together. Everyone here should say, my church, and it should feel that way. Because, I mean, when we utilize these tools for fellowship, friendship, forgiveness, finance, faith, and we have, it gives us fortitude because we know whose church it is. Christ's church. When we say our church, we're talking about our, par, our body, or we're part of the body of Christ. We utilize these tools. The place of my Lord, my Savior, my God, my church, Jesus Christ, who I serve. I'm with you. I'm hungry too, buddy. <laughs> All right.